All right. Okay, so welcome everybody. So today we've got a very exciting uh, resync. You know, we the three of us had a podcast that we did. What was it about? Almost a year ago, right? I think uh, a little was. more. I think maybe yeah, more. Maybe a year and a half yeah. ago, and you know, kind of the backstory there was that I, I've been a pretty kind of quiet, I guess you could say, on the internet over the last couple of years, given a lot of the stuff that's been going on uh, with our company in India. Um, but there was one person or two people that when I met them and heard their story, I felt compelled to, to do a podcast and it was you guys. And, and the, 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 I mean, if people want to hear about kind of the, the real backstory there, uh, they can go listen to that. But I was going to say, maybe just by way of like a quick introduction, do you guys want to recap some of, some of that? And, and just so there's a bit more context in case people, you know, don't get a chance. So Abraham, you yeah. want to maybe start? I just maybe give us, I don't know, a couple minutes on, on your kind of backstory and, and how you came here. Well, Sonia, as you know, I am Venezuelan and former miner. Uh, I started my, this, this journey in the rabbit hole in 2014. And yeah, I, uh, uh, the curious part that I am, I asked for refugee here in Canada after being chased by the Venezuelan government because my mining uh, uh, operations and Bitcoin promoting publicly in Venezuela. Uh, afterwards, they tried to take over the space with Petro, but uh, it was all, it was all fake. And yeah, uh, I met Mauricio here in, in Canada as well, and we become really, really close friends because we share uh, almost the same uh, background and uh, story behind what what is in the in the crypto space excellent yeah mauricio you want to thank you abraham uh and then uh, mauricio you want to take it over and maybe do a quick intro on yourself and then maybe talk a little bit about lead in as well yeah definitely be happy to uh thanks for having me on and, and us back on um so my name is mauricio i am also venezuelan like ibra i uh, as well as not myself and him and many many other venezuelans i got my introduction to bitcoin through mining in Venezuela. Uh, around the same time, actually, I'd say uh, sometime in 2015 is when I, my family started mining. And uh, I was back and forth between Canada and uh, Venezuela at the time. And what struck me as I was building mines and helping people build mines was that there was a uh, lack of um, financial services, call it, uh, and tools for people to grow their mines. The only option was to sell your Bitcoin uh, to basically purchase more equipment. And as I witnessed the frustration myself many times and that many miners did and many other businesses were getting Bitcoin revenues and had fiat expenses. And around those times, selling your Bitcoin was the absolute worst economic decision you could make, just how quickly it was rising. So we decided after building enough mines and realizing that this was a problem that kept showing up, we decided to build a solution for that. And so we built let in on the premise of a Bitcoin back loan, which is a fiat dollar loan, uh, uh, backed by your Bitcoin and you can get your Bitcoin back once you repay the dollar loan. That way it continues being your Bitcoin. You never lose ownership of it. Uh, since then, Ledin has evolved. Uh, and even since our last conversation, we have uh, three live products today. We have clients in a hundred countries. Uh, it's been uh, an incredible you know, journey uh, to date. So we, we expanded from loans into savings accounts. So now people can deposit Bitcoin and USDC with us and earn interest. Uh, and we also have a loan product that is uh, a loan to purchase more Bitcoin, which is called B2X, uh, because that's something we noticed a lot of our clients were doing. They were just taking a loan to buy more Bitcoin, bringing the Bitcoin back, getting another loan, so on and so forth. And we short circuited that entire process to have a very quick, three click process uh, to do that. And that's now today, that's our most popular loan product. Uh, and that, that's really where we're at today. Uh, other things that are you know, exciting to, to share since is how many people have joined our, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. basically have joined Ledin and contributed to it in many ways, uh, Ibra being one of them uh, and, and being almost uh, an invaluable contributor to, the, at least in, in helping me keep in touch with, with everything that's going on in Venezuela with mining. Uh, but yeah, maybe I'll pause there because uh, I could go on forever. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, that, that's awesome. I, I wanted to touch on a couple of things. So, you know, uh, okay, so first question is, is that, 
there is this kind of, um, I guess, a bit of an open-ended question around, you know, does Bitcoin serve a real need outside of, you know, just us Bitcoiners being obsessed with it, right? And and Venezuela is one of those countries that often come up and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've never been to Venezuela. I, my wife's from Colombia, so I've been close, but would never to Venezuela. And, and, I, and I feel like, um, yeah, that narrative is really not clear to me. It's like some people say, oh, it, it, you know, it's not actually helping anyone. It's like only a 0.001% of people that are actually being benefited and therefore it's null. Um, but, you know, but yeah, I'm curious to know, what are your guys' thoughts? I know, Irem, you've had a very illustrious uh, story that you shared with us in the past. And, and Mauricio, you know, you, you shared some things with your brother and, and what had happened with your mining and all that. So, but I'm just curious to know, like, do you guys feel that, or is it still like really early and, you know, that that vision is, you know, maybe 10 years away in terms of actually having an impact on the ground? I don't know. I, you, you, know Ibra, you want to take a swing at it first? Oh, I, yeah, I, have, <laughs> I, have, I have things to say, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll wait. Yeah, Abraham, what are your thoughts? Well, like, is I, there... I think, mm -hmm. well, definitely Bitcoin is really useful, but it kind of, uh, this kind of cases where the country is not uh, performing well in, in economic terms and the population have no way out. Uh, Bitcoin is the first safety net created to, to do so. So I strongly believe Bitcoin have a, uh, a use a use um, maybe in the first world country are not useful per se uh, besides being an investment and, and a hedge against inflation. So it's like, you know, and when I seen, you know, the US government printing a lot of US dollars like crazy, I'm feeling like, you know, I'm going back to what happened in Venezuela that it happened every day. And now I think uh, people is appreciating the uh, Bitcoin as a store of value and hedge against inflation. So for sure, for every day, uh, the average Joe that we that we call, uh, I believe that there is no not too much to do, but for well preserving and is is really 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 a good mean. Yeah, cool. And Mauricio, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think if you if you want to look at this, the I, I like looking at it because it's very hard to tell you, you know, that, that there's X amount of people, you know, saving in Bitcoin or there's X amount of people doing this. Uh, what I what I can tell you sort of as an operator uh, standpoint, I can I can tell you the the sort of doors that Bitcoin opened that were not, not there before. And uh, one of them being access to credit. And by access to credit, I mean being able to borrow dollars. Uh, Venezuelans you know, not just Venezuela, but Colombians, uh, Equatorians, Mexican people, really, it, it, for just to, to name every example, if you wanted to borrow from a U.S. institution at a great rate, they wouldn't give you a loan. There was, there was no collateral that they could take from you to secure those funds, and that's understandable. Their, their jurisdictional boundaries around collateral were very real, and it prevented people in places like Colombia, Venezuela, just anywhere south of Mexico really to accessing US credit, US credit rates and service standards. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. It doesn't matter if it's in India, Venezuela, Colombia, Canada, the US, it is just as liquid, it trades 24 seven. It, it's infinitely divisible. It's the perfect collateral really the way we see it. So not only, so we have had clients tell us up, up front, you Medin is the only source through which I can get a loan. And this is phenomenal. So as far as being able to transact in a global network and, and being able to send, not just, not just get a loan, forget like, let's step up away from getting a loan for a second, remittances. Uh, Venezuela until not very long ago, never heard the word remittances. It never mattered. We were just too rich of a country. Uh, if you look at the rest of the Latin American countries, there is a, very real dependence on remittances in most Latin American countries. Some countries actually, it's their biggest share of GDP. Uh, so in Venezuela, what you're starting to see, given there were some, uh, the study came out, I believe like two or three months ago, but about 10% of families right now in Venezuela are receiving remittances. And sending remittances into Venezuela is very difficult because although the government has tried to create these regulated 
means through which the remittances should come and that they're very clearly overbidding to purchase those remittances relative to what you get on the market, people don't want to go through those rails because they don't want to dox themselves as sending funds to their families and where it's coming from and you have to get KYC and not just KYC, it's KYC with an, with an antagonistic regime. It's, a, it's one thing to do KYC in, in Latin. It, it's another thing to do KYC with the Maduro government and, and tell them exactly how much money is coming through. So um, I think Bitcoin is definitely uh, becoming this sort of remittance rail, uh, an importantly, increasingly important remittance rail, and it's opening access to financial tools that didn't exist before, like savings accounts and loans, the way we offer them. And, uh, you know, to step further from that for a second, we can get into that later in the conversation. Then there's, you, we haven't even touched the crypto dollar format. I really do think that these stable coins, crypto dollars, as people become more used to them and interact with them a bit more and they, and they just stick around for a bit longer, I think you're gonna to start to see people really using them in Venezuela, the way they are starting to use them in China and Nigeria, where they're using Tether to pay merchants. Uh, and supply chains are very powerful because the second you need Tether to pay your merchant, then you might just start getting Tether from your client. And the second your, your client starts needing Tether to pay for things, then they might start asking to get paid in Tether. So it's this big chain that's just getting started in my view. Interesting, interesting. You know, you said, uh, what, what was the word you used to describe the government? Um, antagonistic. What, antagonistic, right. Uh, I'm just curious, just because you guys were born and raised there, uh, were they always so, or was there a turning point uh, in terms of like when they went rogue? <laughs> No, you know, uh, that happened uh, when uh, Hugo Chavez came into the power in, in 1999. Mm. Before that, uh, Venezuela lived mostly in a freedom democracy. Uh, and there were no, the, the government was not antagonist against the population. Mm. Itself it was like more, uh, was not a dictatorship. Uh, with the, you know, the Bolivarian Revolution, this, uh, you know, the, they take away freedom from the population and, you know, the, the like, you know, the concept of the father state, uh, everything is, is uh, have to be controlled by the, by the government. Uh, you lose your, your liberties, your, your freedom. So even the economic freedom to, to, to preserve your wealth. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not about because KYC by itself is not bad because I KYC with Latin is not a, a, because Latin belongs to a country that is not antagonist. But when you KYC in a Venezuelan bank, uh, you are in the literally KYC with the Venezuelan government because they have access to that information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so, interesting. Mm. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and um, you know the all uh, intelligence organisms in Venezuela have access to that information, so they they could track what are you doing and if you have or not, uh, you know, even Bitcoin or uh, US dollars. So you have to be careful in that sense. It's not about being, you know, uh, you know, try to evade regulation or doing money laundering. It's about to protect yourself against someone who's trying to take, uh, to, to, you know, to take out your freedom or your economic freedom and uh, take advantage of what you have, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well said. Yeah. Um, I, I gotta ask, oh, sorry, go ahead, Maurice. Was there a follow-up comment there? No, I just have to say like today, uh, very, yeah. very timely, uh, <clears throat> the, the United Nations actually stated that the Maduro regime has been committing crimes against humanity since 2014. That, that headline came out today. And uh, some people, uh, you know, I think the sort of turning point, like when the real exodus, I, I was having a chat with, with uh, Alex Gladstein the other day about this. And when, when the real exodus happened in Venezuela was right after the, the death of Chavez and the, 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 when, the, when the regime basically showed that they were not going to allow democracy. Uh, so after Chavez died, there was an election. There was this big epic election because you had to pick a new president. Obviously, that was the moment where many of us Venezuelans thought 
things are going to change. And I remember distinctly flying back to vote uh, along with many others and everybody on their on the flights in was just wearing the cap. It was the most inspiring flight in I remember ever taking into Venezuela. So we go into the elections and I, my wife cooked meals for the people that were volunteering in the voting stations. I re, I'm not sure even if you were there or, or involved, but I remember everybody, like everybody was doing everything they could because they knew that this was their chance. So election day comes, everything's going great. The good guys are winning by a, by a long shot going into 6 p.m. 6 p.m., the cheating starts. So they, they start leaving the voting centers open. They start disappearing the ballots. Uh, they, you know, they start uh, uh, ushering witnesses out of the tables forcefully. And, uh, and all of a sudden, everybody's like, no, no, the, elect the numbers aren't in yet. The numbers aren't in yet. Usually when an election is cut off is around 8 p.m., we were into like, I believe it was 11 p.m. And there was still no news. The whole country waited in like a collective gasp for this crooked lady to come down a stair and tell us that Maduro had won. And um, when that happened, the whole country went back out to the streets. We were ready to protest. Like we were ready to demand a recount and to stay out there for as long as we needed. But the regime, very clearly was, was basically saying, we're not going to go away. Uh, and if you want to come out of the streets, we'll bring out the guns. Uh, and, and essentially what the, the good guy who had won, uh, instead of saying, stay out, you know, let's fight for free, like, let's fight for what's right. He said, basically, in other words, I don't want this blood in my hands. I'm conceding. Um, when that happened, I mean, I, it was disheartening. Uh, it was it was just disheartening for for everybody, for myself, uh, for a lot of people that I knew, and that's when I think things turned really dark because uh, people at that point saw. I, 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 by then, there was still this hope that we could get democracy back, but then when that, when that happened, it became really clear that we weren't going to get it back. And so that's when the exodus started. That's when they basically had to stop playing nice. And, uh, and, and they basically started shooting dissidents or jailing dissidents like, just openly. Uh, and they just stopped caring, frankly, about everything. Crazy, crazy. Uh, wow. Um, hey guys, I got a little bit of a, a question for you. Um, I, I noticed your product offering at Lead In, your stories, everything really revolves around Bitcoin. Uh, the other things are they even on the map over in Latin, in Latin America, or I mean, more specifically in Venezuela? Like, I mean, are they serving as like a you know store of value or, or a form of money or anything like that, or are they just literally just noise? <laughs> um, I mean, Ibra, maybe you can. St I can give you sort of my my two cents around that, but uh, maybe Ibra, you you can chime some some details. Yeah, well, uh, I could speak about uh, my personal experience, right? Uh, I, 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 I mine my, my, my wealth, my Bitcoins that I have, and uh, I discover, for instance, Ledin, uh, a way to have a savings account with Bitcoin. And the best part, you receive interest of those Bitcoins. So I'm a really, really a holder, a holder, and I, I like to, you know, I do do not have all my Bitcoins in Latin because I, I, I believe in the like, you know, when, when, when you own your, your, the best way to preserve your Bitcoins is you have responsibility of, on, on them. But uh, letting uh, give you the opportunity to save in another, to, to diversify your risk, to put some Bitcoins on, on a savings account, get more Bitcoins, uh, and you know, it's not uh, you're, tr you're trusting someone, but uh, you know, I, I had that discussion with uh, with Mauricio many times. Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, Bitcoin is trustless, but at some point, you have to trust in someone to uh, transact. And uh, yeah, at least if you send Bitcoins, you know that you that at least some part of what are you doing or what is the matter that connect to that person or if you don't know the person maybe is a, a commercial relationship that 
Um, not necessarily it, it, know the it, it, Abraham, I, what I was kind of getting at was is like, uh, you know how there's other crypto assets, right? Outside of Bitcoin, there's like Ethereum and Ripple yeah. and all these other crypto assets. So what I was curious to know was is that are those also things that are top of mind and, you know, at least amongst your friends in Venezuela, like is this something that has caught the imagination of a lot of people or, um, or is it more really just the conversation around Bitcoin um, as a store of value and a form of um, preserving your wealth? Well, uh, I, I believe, uh, you know, Bitcoin is the, the king in Venezuela. Uh, there's still other coins, Ethereum as well, for sure. Uh, because, but I believe, uh, you know, based on my experience and my, the other fellow miners, they use Ethereum a way to uh, have Bitcoin. They, they hold different, different uh, you know, different uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, not only Bitcoin, even stable coins. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, you know, it's a reality. Uh, I'm, I, I would say I, I'm a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, <laughs> I, I uh, because I do not believe in Ethereum like, a, a, yeah, a store of value. But I recognize the value of the technology behind Ethereum about uh, smart contracts and what uh, they, they could do uh, I, in, in that sense, right? Uh, but yeah. Uh, what about you, Mauricio? I mean, uh, similarly, like a lot of my friends down in Venezuela hold Ethereum uh, as well as Bitcoin uh, to a smaller extent, stable coins. But I think the... Venezuela revolves around a lot around mining because of the heavy electric subsidy that there is. So some of the uh, implications of the crackdown on the mining at scale was that mining ASICs became difficult, right? Because in ASICs, you have to do like electrical upgrades. They, they put out a lot of sound. They put out a lot of noise. So it's, it's difficult to mine ASICs now at scale. Like you, you have to have pretty intricate setups so that you don't, uh, you know, you know, there's rule, you know, Ira will tell you, like, you have a license and sure, but just because you have your minus registered doesn't mean someone's not going to come knocking on your door and, and may ask you for some money. Uh, so you have to have these very intricate setups uh, to sort of not draw too much attention to your facilities. And the big advantage of GPU mining is that it's very quiet. It's very modular. And, if, you know, if you don't have all the power you need in an outlet, don't put as many cards. Like, it's, it's much easier to, to play around with. And so by virtue of that, a lot of people have GPU rigs and they get their hands on some of this Ethereum or, you know, they mm. use applications that, you know, best order routing and then gets you Bitcoin. But, you know, just going back to the point that the source of those coins generally is mining is, you know, you, you can get both because most, largely because there's just two very distinct ways to mine. So I think you still have uh, a presence of both, but what has it's, uh, surprised me a bit is the, the, the lag, I would say, in adoption of stable coins. The, I would have expected it to have happened sooner, the way it's kind of happening in, in Asia, but, uh, but a lot of that is just network effects and like supply chains. So I think it will come, just, it's just not quite there yet. Interesting. Okay, so now to, I guess, talk about, uh, you know, one of the pink elephants in the room. So, you know, you talked about, Ibrahim, about how at one point you need to trust somebody with Bitcoin. There is this, it could be argued that, you know, the Ethereum community is trying to uh, solve some of those problems with DeFi and, and some of these solutions where they're on the Ethereum blockchain. So, what are your thoughts on that? Is that, uh, I don't know, have you guys looked at that? Uh, I know it's like kind of really, uh, it's like a big buzz right now. So curious to know your guys' thoughts on this. You can start, uh, Mauricio. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, we definitely pay attention. Like we're definitely looking at the space and trying to discern what is valuable technology and what is, I'm using this because I'm getting free food tokens and selling the free food tokens later. So I guess what I'm trying to discern really is, are any of these applications real life problem solutions that people will use once the free food runs out? That, that's really the, the sort of main question that I have. I, I'm, you know, intellectually, I'm intrigued by a lot of the proposals. For example, one that I find very interesting is Curve. So this concept of a programmatic way of switching between equivalent assets 
arguably is, is seems pretty unique and pretty interesting. Now, there are with with twenty four hour seven day a week financial services, uh, a lot of things can happen, and and a lot of things you know you may have to adjust for. And I think it, the the challenging part about you know programming finance is that things can happen that you didn't have a rule for. And, and I think, you know, even, even the setups that look flawless or can, you know, initially look good, like circumstances change. That's why laws and legal systems get updated. It's because things change over time. So I, I, I'm a bit nervous at this concept of like a static contract staying uh, and this is being in the wild and anybody can use it. That sounds great when you have a group of very intelligent people that are super savvy about what they're doing. But look at what's happening like this morning, which has had a new, you know, rug pull, uh, this token called SAFE. And, you know, the, the liquidity providers, i.e. the power users, they're all fine because they're just putting in their capital and getting these free tokens and getting people excited. The people that get really hurt are the people that don't have the hundreds of thousands of dollars to be liquidity providers and they just go out and try to buy these tokens based on this hype and then there was a problem with the contract and oh my god so the liquidity providers they just walk away they take their funds to the next project who who gets left holding the bag the retail people the guys that were just learning about it the guys that thought it was interesting the guys that thought oh maybe this is a nice way to save so I just think it's a little bit too early to say, hey, yeah, this thing is going to help people. Uh, we try to, to, to build things that are very actionable and very easy to use for people, like real people. And those are the clients we go for. So uh, when we feel that any of that technology can help our clients, we'll look to bring that in and offer that service. But for now, I think it's a bit too early. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. I just, one quick question. Have you guys heard of uh, Solana? Yeah. No. You I'm have. Uh, just any, any just general thoughts about it? Is it clever? Is it uh, scammy? I, I, I've been watching some videos by this guy and it's like the first thing I've heard in a really long while. It sounds uh, like it's quite interesting where they're not using energy as the anchor, but time which is, you know, another uh, resource that's like obviously finite. And uh, yeah, so I was curious, have you guys looked at their white paper or read into it at all? Like this, I think there's Serum and Solana hype that's been going on as well. Uh, I can't say that I've dug into the white papers. Uh, mm. what, I, what I have seen is that there is this big push. So maybe I'll, I'll, one problem that I'm seeing right now is the, the explosion of stable coins and DeFi is causing a lot of network congestion on Ethereum. And, you know, it's very expensive to transact now on Ethereum. Very, very expensive. And that makes the stable coin, it, it adds an incredible amount of friction to financial transactions. Like if, if you're having to pay very high transaction fees for everything, it becomes very unusable, right? So we, we, we go back to the bigger blocks problem because you don't want to spend ten dollars to spend ten dollars, so it's uh, I, I, there's a there's an arms race going on right now to build this proof of stake, you know, very cheap, efficient, quick uh, blockchain, and, and be that next step from Ethereum. Like basically, people are trying to beat Ethereum to ETH 2.0, in my view. And uh, there's there's a few bidders for this. Like there's Algorand; they have an interesting concept as well for like very quick and very uh, fast transaction processing. I've heard Solana, uh, you know, it, it, obviously there's very, uh, very transaction heavy projects being built on it. And, uh, and it seems to be holding steady. I don't know enough about them to comment on their sort of technical integrity, but I think the, the general concept is that there's this arms race to be that financial services chain that has finite, cheap, and, you know, very quick transactions, but it's a, it's a hard problem to solve. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think it's an exciting time to be around. Hey guys, I know I'm jumping around a bit. Oh, sorry, Abraham, did you have some comments on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, the point 
I was hearing about uh, what's what's going on with, with Ethereum and you know DeFi uh, about DeFi. Uh, I, I don't like what's there are you know the 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 you know the uh, you know three hundred percent of ROI in an investment is something wrong there. It's like a, you know the the first rule of any investment is like some uh, where's the catch. And the catch, uh, you know, at some point, uh, you have to pay it uh, anyway in transaction fees. Like, oh, sometimes, I'll, oh, I invest this amount, but I have to pay, uh, you know, I lost all my gains in transaction fees. So there is no way out in that kind of investment. I, I believe it's, it's risky uh, in that sense. I like the technology, the, the concept, but I believe when you know, the decentralization and, you know, the, you know, open source or the nature of open source makes all, uh, people who have a, a technological advantage and knowledge and coding to create copies and, and you see what happened with the Suchi thing. So uh, in that sense, I don't like that, uh, you know, being the first, the first mover in that kind of technologies as, uh, 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 Mauricio said, uh, in that sense, uh, Ethereum, what I don't like from Ethereum is the technological risk. It's, a, it's again, uh, you know, I, be, I really, really believe in proof of work. The proof of work is the only way, well, from my perspective, is the only way you can, uh, you know, keep secure and uh, a really, really, really good network. A, 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 a really good network. But what happened with proof of stake is not really proven. So, you know, the stability of that network is in risk. So I, I don't believe, uh, you know, in easy solutions. There's always a trade-off. If you want to be a stable, secure, and decentralized network, you have to uh, give away something. And what you're giving away is fast transactions, or uh, you're gonna pay it uh, in, in a different way in fees. But you cannot have the three things at the same times. Where you know it's 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 too good to be true. Um, so there was a recent interview that um, McCormick, Peter McCormick, did with Samson Mao and Vitalik. Have you guys seen this? Yeah, I heard a bit of it, most of it, yeah. yeah. I, I, I tweeted it out yesterday saying this is so good. Uh, because, you know, I, look, I'm a, I'm a fan of, I mean, I'm a fan of the free market. Let's start there. So obviously I'm a fan of ideas and, you know, I, I want to see good ideas flourish. Um, I wrote a blog about it yesterday too, is that there was one paragraph by, or one kind of statement by Vitalik that I felt really, you know, kind of, captured uh, two things. One is really, you know, the, 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 the power of, of Bitcoin. And the second was uh, kind of, I guess, the main point where Ethereum struggles. And so I'll just, uh, I'll just quickly read some of this to you guys. So he says, I think one of the greatest, one of the great strengths that Bitcoin has, it presents itself as a holistic philosophy that combines together ideas around the world and economics and politics and finance with a clear picture what Bitcoin is going to do about it. Ideas around Austrian economics, concerns around money printing, concerns about governments having power over money, concerns about governments having power over the payments layer. Here is Bitcoin, this base asset and payment system that is not vulnerable to control by governments in the same way. So I thought that was very eloquent. And then his next paragraph is about Ethereum. He says, if you look at Ethereum, on the other hand, it definitely doesn't have this unified narrative. It does kind of create a community that sometimes has a bit more of kind of not knowing what it stands for at certain times. And that's something that, you know, I think a lot of people are definitely kind of trying to move past and get a clear. My point is, is like, oh um, so, so, so I, I, after I tweeted, you know, this is so good, um, Vitalik's dad <laughs> tweeted at me saying, what's your key takeaway? And so I shared that, you know, I felt that, uh, you know, I was, I was, it was refreshing to see how uh, self-aware Vitalik is to some extent, right? The fact that he was able to articulate that and say that, look, that's one of our biggest challenges is we don't know what we stand for. And, you know, I've known Vitalik and these guys since like before they, they launched, uh, you know, the, the whole project. And 
I'm not going to lie. Like that's been my main, I would say if I had to articulate it in a sentence, that's been my concern as well. It's like, well, what does it stand for? And if you don't know what something stands for, it's hard to, you know, put your, put your life savings in it, put your life's work into it. And, and, and so, so what his dad was said was, is that, you know, I think that's both Ethereum's like biggest strength and weakness, which, which I think I, I tend to agree with. Um, anyway, so I think it's fun. Uh, hey guys, one thing, uh, have you guys heard of RSK? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I know Diego. Thoughts I know on, actually, yeah. 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 I love yeah. Diego. So, what are your guys' thoughts on that? And uh, you know, kind of solidity on top, or is, is smart contracts on top of uh, Bitcoin. I don't know. I, I find that idea intriguing. I'm a bit surprised. I mean, maybe I'm missing some of it, but I'm a bit surprised that it's not really a bigger thing. Yeah. I. I you know. I agree. I think part of that probably is because of their geographical location and, and where a lot of these devs are that, that build on top of these layers, right? I think that the fact that they, you know, that they're in Argentina and I think that's where a lot of their sort of core group of people is. And maybe it's the fact that there's just not so much development going on. There might be some, some end users of digital assets, but the development scene is not as I would say active as perhaps it's in North America and, and, you know, and going back to the, this issue or the, the comment that you made about Vitalik, I thought it's spot on because when you, when you have this identity crisis, you know, this bit of like, what am I, what am I here to do? It's very hard to optimize for something because you, you know, and you're just going to keep everything generalistic. And, and so like the, 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 it, your goal is to have the most things to be able to do this, to, to use it. Right. But there is no real, that, you know, this is what it does best, right? Like this is it for this chain. Like this is what, you know, for a while it was ICOs and, and that, you know, was sort of a, a, a revolutionary way of raising capital. And, you know, that led to, you know, other types of tokens, which eventually led to stable coins, uh, which were the next kind of big thing. Now the, the sort of interest around stable coins has now led to this second order effect, which is, uh, you know, DeFi uh, and, and DEX is somewhere in between there. So there's just a lot of use cases, right? And, so, and but it's, it's undeniable. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I think I was, uh, I, I was never a big Ethereum advocate, um, but I'm not going to lie. I think I, I, I do see how, even though it comes at a great risk, perhaps to the community at large, um, like for example, it could be argued that a lot of the regulatory pushback that the countries are seeing around the world um, could be attributed to some of these ICOs and things where people are like, you know, losing their money and whatnot, right? And so, so I do stand by my earlier kind of, you know, hesitation around embracing uh, Ethereum. But I will also sit here and say that I, I am impressed by the thing, by the fact that ideas are being tried at, at, at a very quick pace. And, and if yeah. nothing else, it gives Bitcoin a bit of a uh, you know, um, visibility into like what type of markets might be out there and what might be interesting. So again, so the, uh, yeah, so, so again, from, coming from a free market perspective, obviously ideas are great. Um, but I do think that nature of moving fast, breaking things and just like trying anything and everything, it, when I think about it, it's, it's, it's a bit concerning, but it's all obviously very fascinating. And then like you said, Abraham, I, I read a lot about these, uh, these new projects and, it is incredible to see the the level of innovation that's happening there. Um, okay, so speaking of, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. But I have a question for you. What do you think yeah, yeah. about uh, INX and this controversy? This, you know, this, uh, you know, these influencers, uh, up, uh, you know, backing up this idea. And what do you think about the 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 idea in general? Right? Uh, what's your opinion? What? About? I, 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 the I might INX. not be totally. I, I might not be totally up to date, but I think that was on Twitter recently, right? Is that the one where yes. they? Oh, is that the one, Jameson? Yes. Was, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I love Jameson, first of all. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. Um, look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how to say. I don't know. Look. Look. I, I am. You know, an advisor to Polymath, for example. Okay. I'm an advisor to Bank to the Future. Uh, so I'm not going to say that, and these, these are projects that are using ERC-20 tokens initially to, to get off the ground, to, to, but they're doing what I consider to be, you know, kind of the future of fundraising is security tokens. Like I, you know, I'm not, 
yeah, but I'm a prag like uh, I like to think of myself as a realist, right? And so uh, I, I like what I, again. I know they haven't really seen the light of day, but um, so so I guess what I'm getting at, I think the INX had something to do with that, where it was some sort of regulated way of using ERC twenty tokens to essentially raise funds for a company. So am I against it? I mean, you're essentially using you're you're using Ethereum as opposed to let's say a spreadsheet. Uh, so do I think Ethereum's probably a bit more reliable than, you know, a file sitting on my computer, maybe? Uh, so, so, it, so I guess in that way, I'm mildly okay with it, you know, um, but I, I'm against generally the, the ICO trend was something we, I stayed away from. We stayed away from because I used to be a financial advisor like 15 years ago and I got all my licenses and I know all the rules about these types of things. And I know that like as a no-no, you're not supposed to take money from your neighbor or like just the guy down the street or like random people who you can like get excited and then you just share a pitch and then they're like, okay, take half my money that I took, you know, the last 15 years to, to, to save up. Like, I, I don't want that kind of that risk, right? I'd much rather go to, you know, an investor who's like a billionaire who, even if they lose the hundred K or whatever that they give us, they're not going to, you know, die or they're not going to lose sleep. So to me that like, again, see, I'm not against regulations per se. Um, I think it's important to kind of look at what the, you know, the reasoning behind some of these regs are and to try and extrapolate a bit and be like, oh wait, that's obviously not cool. So let's not do that. But like I said, DeFi, uh, it's caught my imagination. I'm not going to lie. Like DEXs are something that obviously, you know, we've been, I've been thinking about since, since 2013. And for the first time, I feel like it's, kind of possible and maybe not on ethereum maybe on ethereum but things like solana and when i hear these people talk like i think one thing i'm kind of good at is i'm not good at being a smart person but i'm good at finding smart people and and that solana guy sounds super smart to me and and he, the fact that he worked at qualcomm and, and built you know chips that are inside our phones and uh and and again like just the white paper and everything they're talking about to me sounds like a unit step function. And that's always been my challenge with all the other projects. I never felt like Bitcoin to me represented a unit step function increase in innovation from any, everything before it. But everything that I've seen come after it has always been, you know, marginal kind of incremental improvements. Like, oh, we changed, you know, uh, the supply from this to this, or, you know, we, it's like, okay, or Litecoin. Like, I think there's like three <laughs> parameter changes, like, and that's supposed to be, you know, innovative. Okay. <laughs> So yeah, anyways, um, okay, guys, one more question I wanted to get at. Okay, so I think this is fairly relevant and we probably wouldn't even be talking about this if, if COVID wasn't a real thing. Um, but what are your thoughts on UBI, universal basic income? I, I, uh, I think it's, I, I jokingly, I call it universal basic inflation uh, because that, that's essentially what's gonna happen, right? Like people think, oh, you know, we're just going to start getting this free money every month. And we've been there. We, we've been on the receiving end of that free money. Uh, and you, there, there is an eventual consequence to printing money, which is what people don't really, you know, people are reading the deficit myth and, and, you know, they're seeing that, oh, you know, the U.S. has just printed something and then Coke's still a dollar. And it's like, you know, that's, that's sort of the conclusion. And it, you're very quick to jump to that conclusion. <laughs> And very, very, very few countries, I would maybe dare say one, has this ability to print at will and get the demand soaked up by the world and not create inflation internally. And that country is the United States uh, because it is the base currency for every, pretty much every financial contract, most financial contracts in the world. Like for some context, I think it's something like 25, 20 to 25% of the world's GDP is in the United States. So the you know it's it is an idea that has a lot of allure it is an idea that can rally a lot of people because who wouldn't want to check every month what, what people are don't un, really understand is that once you start a printing schedule for millions of people every month that's billions of new dollars that are now entering your economy and that are chasing to be spent because not everyone in the economy is living off of it. A lot of people just get it and they, you know, they'll, they'll buy Bitcoin with it or they'll buy, you know, whatever, or they'll pay down debt. They'll do something with it. They'll buy a house, they'll buy a car. So what this does is that increases monetary velocity. 
when monetary velocity increases and monetary supply increases, the price of things increases. It's a function of those two things. So yes, you're going to keep getting this check, but things are going to increase in value pretty much at the same speed. <laughs> so what it does is that it creates other dislocations. So right now people think, oh, things are, things, things are unfair because the way this is set up is unfair. They think this is set up is unfair. And like, we need you to intercede and make things fair again. But every time you intercede to try to make things fair again, you create unfair things in a different setup. <laughs> so all I'm trying to say is that it's not without a consequence and that it, it, while it may be a great carrot to dangle, not everybody understands the second order consequences of this. And Abraham, what are your thoughts on it? Well, uh, I'm against uh, universal ba basic income in the short term, but in the long term, I believe must could be necessary because, you know, think about, uh, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, the automation is going to take over all the, all the jobs, right? Uh, robots, AI, you are competing against something that maybe you are, uh, as a human, you are not going to be prepared, right? So at some point, uh, you know, the, the people who have the capital have, you know, factory, automated factories where they need the market. They need people who consume, right? So at some point, the, you know, I know the jobs could move some, for something more, you know, creative jobs or counselor is going to be like more rewarded in the, fu like in the future, that's is, is my, my opinion. So at some point, you need like a basic income to the people keep consuming, right? But, it, but the problem is, is how you con can control the demand. Because, okay, you put, it's again, as Mauricio said, if you put that uh, influx of money without, uh, you know, the proper, uh, you know, increasing production of, uh, of products and services, you are doomed. You know? Okay, so, so yeah, no, I agree with you. So, by the way, I, like I said, I, before I got into Bitcoin, I spent 10 years in, in robotics. So I've been to every major robot lab in the world. Um, and like I said, I drive a, a Tesla that literally drives itself. Um, I have drones, I have 3D printers. So I'm like a huge, my wife's a mechatronics engineer. Uh, in the first graduating Colombian class. Uh, anyways, uh, anyway, so I was going to say is that I... Uh, so first of all, number one, I am obviously a believer in freedom. So I'm with you, uh, Mauricio, in terms of like, I don't believe that uh, a basic income that's like, let's say, just supported by governments via money printing and inflation is optimal. So I 100% agree with you on that. Um, however, Abraham, I also agree with you that um, I don't think this is like a Luddite-ish comment. I, 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 if you spend time in this space and robotics and you see kind of, you know, the singularity coming, um, you realize that, 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 yeah. So what's going to happen when literally in, in the next couple of years, all trucks drive themselves, we're going to go tell these truck drivers to go and become programmers, right. Or artists. I think it might be a little challenging. And so what I'm getting at is, is that check out a project called, called good dollar. It's, have you guys heard of eToro? Yeah. Okay, so Yanni is like, I think one of the smartest people I've ever met. He's, uh, he's got a colored, he was one of the founders of colored coins, right? Really, wow. really smart. This guy was hitting me up back in like 2012, 2013, like, you know, on Twitter being like, you guys should do like a rupee on the blockchain. And anyway, so he, um, I was recently at the OECD. I don't know if you guys know what the OECD is, but they're like the, the regulator of regulators. They invited me to go speak because of the whole, you know, situation in India and all that. And the keynote speaker was... Uh, Liani at this at this event, and he spoke about an ERC twenty based uh, good dollar Ubi project by the free market, not by governments, um, that essentially you know uh, give money back to everyone, and you can literally go sign up on GoodDollar.com now and 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 like redeem your daily uh, Ubi on there. Um, and the way they operate is, I mean, what they claim, right? And it might be a little bit off, but they they essentially use these like profits that are being generated on chain uh, with uh, whatever, right? These different yield farming and blah, blah, blah. They get people who have money to put money in there and they take the, the profits and they spread that amongst uh, all of the people, if you will. And, and so where I'm going with this is that I, lately I've been having this like vision of, of like, could there be 
like, could there, because, you know, okay, let me just set the context. Apple, everyone's against Google, like draconian future, right? They control the world. We've got this like robotics AI renaissance that's coming, right? And if you extrapolate this into the future, like data and all of this is really housed behind government doors. Um, and, and it's like this kind of really scary future, right? So what if, what if humanity were to devise a system by using blockchain where they could have the uh, have the profits that are generated by robotics and automation fed back into some sort of ubi okay yeah. what if you literally like strung together projects like pine 64 which is like an open source hardware software computer laptop you mean you want to buy a brain for a robot you can buy it there right you want to and then you take robotic operating systems like ross that are open source you, you, and then you start imagining a future where you rebuild everything, all of our phones um, for this, again, this coming renaissance where we create kind of the neural network of this, you know, this future AI that we all govern and control with our phones and our ID, right? Um, and anyway, so this is like, this is like a thing that I've been like riffing on in my brain and talking to my wife about, and I'm gonna start writing more about it, but I think there might be something there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know the problem is there. How do you distribute? Uh, you know the, the e because you distribute the the money or the the uh, base on how how hard you work or how how many risks do you are you taking the investment? Right, basically is the most. So I you see, my my main, even my main concern is half the world lives on ten dollars or less a day. If we could figure out how to even get $10 into the pockets of everybody, $10, I think you would take a big step towards alleviating all this. And my, and I guess my overall thing is, is like, if you think about it from first principles, not from like the world we live in today, if you think about it, like, okay, given the technology that we have, given what's happening, is there a way, again, not governments, not through force, not through guns, but through using technology, is there a way where we can systematically recreate everything where, like I said, where, where we kind of um, in a fair way profits and in a fair way, give it equally to everyone, right? So if, if the your Ubi, contribution in society, because it's well, no, I was, I was going to say no. And Ubi, I mean, the thought, and by the way, Elon Musk is talking about Ubi, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is talking about Ubi, Andrew Yang ran on the whatever. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 so, so I do think it's, it's and with COVID, right? Like, how do, like, I'm a huge free market guy. I'm all about like, you know, not trampling on other people's freedoms. Like, how does a world operate? And, and if, if, if part of the underlying um, notion is that, well, we don't want it to be done via government force, then again, could the free market potentially come up with a solution for this? And I, th and I feel, and again, I can share about eight or nine white papers or like ideas that I've kind of been reading and I think that it's like Lego pieces. They all coming together being like, holy cow, maybe we could do something here. Anyways, <laughs> that's probably the first yeah. time I've ever mentioned yeah. this. <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, to me, I, I have this perhaps wrong image, but the mental model that I have is that you, you can't have UBI without senior edge. Like you, you know, the, the only person that could do UBI is he who can print the coin. The otherwise, otherwise is, is just a redistribution of wealth. And it has to, and that redistribution of wealth has to be voluntary or forceful. Uh, so, in a in a government, you have both. You have the ability to redistribute wealth forcefully, and you have seniorage. And so, if anybody I think is in the position to roll out UBI, I would think it would be a government. Um, yeah, it, it, uh, know, guys, I'll share the Good Dollar project with you, but do check it out because yeah. uh, no, like, he had the keynote spot at OECD, which is like the government of all governments type of deal. And they're kind of, you know, pushing for this. And I think it's super brilliant. And again, you know, it's not a, like, I think if you look at the world as in like, uh, you know, communism versus capitalism, and we kind of give into these like notions that obviously govern our world today. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is like, can it all be rethought of, like not in a sure. forceful way, in a way where, like I said, not the profits of um, companies or people, but like you had some way where the profits of automation. So right now it's already happening. Good dollar is literally taking the profits from these automated bots that, you know, do liquid, liquid provisioning, liquidity provisioning and, you know, whatever, like you said, curve. And they're taking those profits and giving it back to everyone. I'm I saying, see. What if you do that at scale? What if like, right. 
you created like car companies and phone companies and all of it based on like an underlying, this sounds nuts. I'm, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys, guys, uh, okay. I had a couple questions uh, before we, you know, try to close this. So, okay. One of my questions was, uh, so what is, what's one important truth uh, that do you do very few people agree with you on? So I was going to maybe ask, I don't know, maybe Mauricio, I can start with you and then go to Abraham. So what's, what's an important truth? Very people agree with you. And I was going to say, if, you, if you're down, we can maybe do it in a two-part way where one is more like the world and then second, maybe within the crypto space. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I mean, I try not to stay too uh, incendiary or too polemical with the, with the comments, but, you know, given the Venezuela experience that, um, the, you know, Ira and I both lived through, one of the things that I, that I, that, that I've had a challenge with as far as reconciling in my head is this concept that democracy gives you always the best choice and, and democracy always leads to the right decision. Uh, and, and I think that that is not always true. Uh, that the, the, the example I give is Venezuela, right? And, and when a pool of voters, your results are gonna be as qualified as the information that these voters have and how and their ability to process. So if, if you think of a democracy as a black box and you feed it misinformation, uh, you know, and like not a clear system and like a rig counting, you know, like a, a rig sort of monitoring, you're gonna get an equally shady result. So I guess the the the, the truth I would say is that, you know, the 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 best outcome will be decided by democracy, I think is, is something that I don't always agree with. But do you have a counter to that as in like what might be a solution? Um, and, and by the way, yeah. on that point as well, I couldn't help but think like, is, could technology and our technology like blockchain and all that, if you, if you marry it with identity, and I know identity is scary, uh, usually because of the way it works as governments just collect it or companies collect it and use it against us. But you, there is, this concept of sovereign identity, which is that you control your identity and who you share it with and, and using cryptography. So I'm curious to know is that, again, marrying kind of blockchain with identity um, couldn't like to me again, it seems super easy and possible to, to make it so that okay, like, like on good dollar, right? For example, how do they ensure that I don't go and claim $10? I just do a video of me and they have some database that ensures that that I haven't, you know, tried to claim it, right? And right. I think you could even do that potentially in a way that's privacy preserving where you're not like collecting everyone's video, like you're just doing, um, you obfuscate it. So my point is, is like, if we have the technology to do facial recognition and all of that, like, couldn't you use this? And I know it can be used in a very draconian way as well, but couldn't you foreseeably use it in a very open, in an open source, but like uh, in a way that empowers people to make, you know, decisions. I mean, there's a yeah. fundamental, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I think absolutely. Like, listen, I inherently think people are intelligent and people will act in their best interest and their best interest should help the collective interest if the incentives are set up properly. So again, I'm not, I'm not trying to say that like, you know, Venezuelans are this or that, or that North Koreans are this or that. They are not, they're not even given the option to, to get new to get the information they need that, that it's constrained so they are not properly informed and in fact there's some a lot of times misinformed so that they can make decisions based on an agenda right that that someone else has so you know you i don't think you have to fix democracy like i think you just have to bring down these these boundaries that poison the, the information flow and that and that create these like twisted mental models in people's heads. So, you know, typical case is like one of the one of the things that poisoned the feedback loop in Venezuela was that as Chavez was expropriating companies and doing things that would literally kill any economy, oil was rallying in the background. So he basically just kept forcing money into the streets. And there was this idea of prosperity. So the, the feedback loop was Chavez is shutting down private companies that have been working for decades and firing hundreds of thousands of people and staffing them with their buddies. 
And that is somehow creating prosperity for us. So let's just go and keep voting for Chavez. And as this was happening, he shut down pretty much every news outlet. Every independent news outlet was shut down. There are none left today. And there you go. <laughs> you know, the, the, the first things you go for are the information flows. And the first people you choose, and Chavez was also very systematic. Iura, you remember this. When oil was riding high, one of the first things he made possible was to say, hey, smart young Venezuelan, do you feel like you would like to go study abroad? I will finance it for you. I don't want smart people that are challenging my ideals in the country. Why don't you go out and have a nice four-year vacation and stay there while you're at it? And that was very effective. I'm a product, my, you know, I'm a product of that program. I was able to come to university in Canada because of that program and I'm still here. Mm. So just an example. <laughs> and what about you, Abraham? What's, uh, what, what's an important truth that very few people agree with you on? Uh, well, it's about uh, climate change. I believe that climate change is caused by humans, but the problem is the solution that is proposed, the green solutions about, you know, renewables, solar, solar, wind, etc., is not the answer. I believe the answer is uh, um, like uncomfortable one is nuclear. Nuclear. <laughs> well, are you talking about the small ones you bury under your neighborhood or something? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I've heard a lot of uh, smart people talk about this as well. Hmm. And yeah, because it's, the other ones are not sustainable and cannot replace uh, the, the, the fossil fuels. So I believe, uh, yeah, it's, uh, everyone say, Bob, it's not safe. Uh, yeah, but it's outdated technology. Uh, I, I, I believe in techno technology could solve everything. Mm. So, but the only viable, uh, I believe, is nuclear. So, but do not, mm. you know, people, you know, like ambientalists, Greenpeace followers do not like nuclear. Uh, so, uh, mm. yeah, I, I believe there's a, always a safe way to do, to uh, generate energy, right? Very interesting. Very interesting. Cool guys. Uh, I had, a, I mean, a couple other questions here, but I think we covered a lot of ground. I don't know. I wanted to give you guys some time in terms of like, do you want to tell people where people can learn more about you guys and about your companies and all that? Do you want to maybe share a little bit about that before we close out? This has been really fun, yeah. by the way. It's been like, interesting. We should do this again. Like, I don't know, once a month or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Like we should, I don't know. Um, yeah. No, I just find there's so much nonsense out there, man. It's like, you know, I'm sure people are going to enjoy hearing about like, you know, real life stuff. Right. Um, but, but yeah, t tell me, go ahead. No, I, 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 I had a great time. I didn't really get to ask you to think some things I wanted to ask you about India. So we need to do this again. Uh, yeah. Do you guys want to ask me? I got a few minutes before my next call here. Do you guys want to, I don't know. Do you want me to like share any small things here and there? Uh, yeah. I mean, we talked a lot about the, the adoption in Venezuela and like how people are using it, but I'd love to hear more about like, what are you seeing in India? Like how are people using Bitcoin? Is it still a, a small number of people is it getting broader are people using bitcoin for more than just hedging like are people using we know we have seen some traffic from india even some like clients you know people that come in asking for loans and you know opening savings accounts so i'm, I'm always curious to hear what you're seeing on the ground i would say we started this conversation talking about two things and i was so happy that we were talking about that because in my mind those are the things that bitcoin solve and do it really well which is store of value and, uh, you know, as you guys probably know, India is the largest, you know, gold purchaser in the world. I mean, there's, there's so much gold in India. Um, and so, so Bitcoin, I've always felt, and I think that thesis is playing out is, is uh, that, that the, especially the younger, more tech savvy population will start to see kind of the promise in Bitcoin and the advantages of Bitcoin over even gold. Um, and so that is obviously, I would say, kind of the biggest use case. Uh, um, and then and then the second being, again, what you guys talked about, which was remittance. And I've always felt that that's in, in India, once again, is the largest inward remitter in the world as well. More, more money goes back to India than any other country. And so, um, you know, and on that point of remittance, I just wanted to say is, is that, you know, people talk a lot about um, like government aid and things like that. Um, I, I actually believe that things like that don't have nearly as much of an impact as remittance does like 
when my dad is sending back, you know, a hundred dollars to his mom uh, in Calcutta, um, you know, nobody knows what she needs more than my dad. Right. And so I think when you have like families sending money back, like that is like the most targeted way of getting like much needed funds. And so I've always really been, you know, passionate about um, leveraging Bitcoin to, to enable um, remittance. So I'd say that's a second thing, you know, we have a lot of, um, like IT professionals in Bangalore and, and in India. So a lot of them, you know, they, they're, they're pretty clever and, and they see that if they use, you know, uh, let's say whatever the traditional means of getting money, it'll take them a week. Uh, they'll oftentimes lose, you know, 10% or something or 12% of their money. But with using Bitcoin and Unocoin there, they're able to get their money almost instantly and get all of it. And, and so, you know, that's the second thing. Um, you know, I, I shared, I don't think I did share on this call, but um, yeah, Unocoin recently had a pretty interesting uh, thing happen where uh, the Supreme Court, in, so two years ago, the cent, and I mentioned this, I think in our last podcast, two years ago, the central bank essentially tried to ban all um, banks or prohibit all banks from working with crypto companies. Uh, the crypto community at large took the uh, RBI, the Reserve Bank, to court. Um, that got elevated to the Supreme Court. It was a long, two-year-long kind of drawn-out battle, um, and all three judges sided with with the crypto community. And, and I'm really proud of um, the Unocoin team and the guys. They did so much work. You know, whether it be like financially supporting, you know, more than half the the legal bills, whether it be Harish putting his own kind of life on the line and being really the you know one of the the kind of the main points that that came up was the 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 judges said okay you guys are essentially fighting this battle on the basis of human rights um but you guys are all companies like companies don't have human rights like show us an example of an actual person that was negatively impacted by this ruling and it was actually my co-founder harish who, um, you know, whether it be having to lay off a hundred people, whether it be, you know, all the different craziness that, that he's had to go through, it was his kind of life that was put out there and, and, and yeah, and, and used as like evidence or whatever, if you will. And so massive, like massive. I mean, if you would have asked me even six months ago, I, I don't think I would have uh, expected that outcome just because, you know, the, the odds were definitely stacked up against us, but we're just so grateful to all of our customers, our investors, and, um, you know, all of our team members. So, yeah, so now that we're back, things are really on the up and up. You know, we have about a million and a half users on our platform. They're all starting to flood back in and, and start to, to, you know, buy Bitcoin and use all the different features and things we have. And, and, and we've got some really exciting news that we're going to be, you know, coming out with in the next week. So, um, mom's the word. But, yeah, man, I'm just super happy. I kind of feel like I'm in a, a bit of a dream state, you know, um, just grateful that we're all here and getting to do what we love. Uh, yeah, man, that's about it. <laughs> that's great, man. Well, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy to see that, uh, you know, that, that justice prevailed uh, in India. And that's great to see it prevailing in some places. <laughs> mm, congratulations, uh, <laughs> man. Yeah, and you know, and I think another place we should be grateful for is Canada. Um, you know, you guys are in Canada. I'm doing the thing out in India with my co-founders, but I'm Canadian. And, uh, you know, yesterday's heated debate that I was mentioning about between Vitalik and Samson Mao from Blockstream are both Canadian. Um, I think there's something special about Canada as well. I think there's something happening here. I think it's kind of like you know, what the Silicon Valley used to be for tech, I think Canada is for, for crypto in many ways. I, I agree. I, I, I say this to everybody like a preacher. I'm like, Canada punches way above its weight in, in crypto. Like, people don't give it the respect it deserves. Not as far as the demands, but it's contributed a hell of a lot. And it should get a lot more credit as a community. Mm -hmm. uh, but... But hey, you know, we're moving forward. So we, we've had our share of uh, Gerald Cottons <laughs> and like the quadrigas uh, yeah. of the world. You know, oh, uh, maybe God. on another podcast, I'll share that story. But I actually, yeah, anyways, uh, it's really unfortunate what's happened in Canada. So I think, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, it's all, it's all coming out here. But I think uh, I'm just, I just feel super, super lucky to be living in Canada. Yeah. Uh, I I believe Canada as a first mover, uh, uh, you know, you know, Canadians are not risk takers, 
but I think for the first time I'm seeing something different, right? It's like the uh, crypto world here is a lot, they're, they're open-minded. So they are uh, really, really uh, willing to understand and, you know, give it a shot, uh, uh, a new thing to improve the world, right? So uh, I'm, I'm really glad and happy to belong to this community and, you know, to collaborate uh, as much as I can. And yeah, uh, I totally agree with you guys. <laughs> Sorry, one of the companies that I'm, I'm quite involved with here in Canada is a company called Paycase. And, uh, you know, we've gone through our, our share of challenges there as well. Um, and, uh, and it's just, you know, I think someday, I really think someday someone's got to write a book on all this. And uh, maybe we'll just start with these, we'll start with these podcasts for now, start articling some of these <laughs> stories. But uh, yeah, maybe we'll do like a, a, a collab or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have that Google Mail issue of the day that Quadra guy went down, like that main, that, that red, remember that red full page, like uh, the feature that they did at the front, the cover. I actually, mm -hmm. I have a copy of it. I have a copy of it somewhere. I, I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere. Yeah, it's pretty sad, but hey guys, like it's super exciting to see, you know, people like you doing great work and uh, yeah, I guess we'll just stay in touch and thanks again for your time guys. Anytime, man. Thanks for having me. All right. <laughs>